Good morning, Grace. <laughs> How y'all doing this morning? Why don't you stand on your feet and join me in our mission and vision this morning? All right, our mission is to preach the simple truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the entangled, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to comfort the hurt and discouraged, to restore the abandoned and forsaken into the fellowship by grace, to create awareness of our God-given gifts that we may serve the Lord with our whole hearts, minds, and spirits. Therefore, we are preparing to be a people ready to meet Christ at his return. Our vision, to stand nonviolently against oppressive powers affecting the natural and spiritual productivity within our homes, churches, and communities through comprehensive, compassionate outreach ministries. Amen. Amen. So y'all know it, it, this is the culmination of Women's Month. Let's give the women a hand for this. We've done a wonderful job this month. And with that being said, may I have my scroll, please? Thank you. Let's give our babies a hand. <laughs> All right, our scripture for today is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just grateful that God will establish me because I... I can be a little unsteady sometimes. <laughs> well, let's go up in, in praise and worship and prayer. Um, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. Oh.
of our hearts, a lifter up of our heads, God, a restorer of our joy, Lord. We were in the back before prayer and God, the laughter that went up, God. It wasn't a, a laughter because we were de- being mean or malicious, but God, it was a laughter of camaraderie, God. A laughter of joy, God, and we thank you for that, God. Because so much is going on in people's lives, Lord, that it's hard for them to even smile sometimes. But God, we thank you that you restore the joy, restore the joy, restore the joy in our lives, God. Let us find the happiness and the light in the smallest of things, God. We ask that you do that for us right now, God. We ask that you come in, Lord. Come in right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. With grateful hearts, we thank you, Lord. With grateful hearts, we lift you up, Lord. With grateful hearts, we offer you praise, God. Because you're here, God. You never leave us. You're always there, Lord. You're always there. You're always there, God. You're always there, God. You're always there, God. Even through my darkest times, you were there. Even when I wanted to give up, God, you were there. When I didn't want to live anymore, God, you were there. When I didn't know which way to go, God, you were there, God. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that you never let go of me. I'm grateful that you never left me, God. I'm grateful, God, that you're always there holding me, God, wrapping your love do that for others, God, for those that feel like they can't go any further, God, for those who want to give up, God. Oh, God, we ask that you comfort, be a comfort to the heart, be a comfort to the brokenhearted, Lord, be a comfort to those who are sick and ailing, God. Oh, God, and not just a comfort, God, we ask for your healing, God. We ask for your restoration, God, like only you can, God. Restore, God, not just the joy, but restore the health, God. Restore, God, the ability of the limbs, God. Restore, God. Restore, God. Restore, God. Restore, God. I feel you, God, saying restore. Restore, I restore what the the enemy tried to steal. I'm restoring what the canker worm has eaten. I'm restoring. What you have lost, I'm restoring what we lost at our own hand. I'm restoring what we lost because we were disobedient to you, God. we need to do, God, but prepare us, God, prepare our minds, 
important, God, and we thank you for the story. We thank you for the testimonies that are going to go forth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, because you're worthy to be praised, God. You're worthy to be praised, God. Oh, we're worthy to be praised, God. I just want to thank you in advance. Oh, we glorify your name, God. We thank you, God, for the plan that you have for us, God. We thank you, Lord, because you set this plan before we were even formed. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. These things we ask in your name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 And, and this morning's epistles are from our newest member, Sister Linda Carter, and our friend of grace, Sister Tisa Jefferson. And following um, our, our um, word, our message will be brought to our bear, by our very own Mother uh, Bird. So let's give them a hand in that order. Amen. Good morning, Grace. Beautiful day today. Thank God for today. Thank God for Palm Sunday. I have really enjoyed Women's Month. We've had some awesome living epistle speakers, testimonies. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Yes, we've had, I'm, I'm sorry. We've had some awesome speakers for Women's Month, the Living Epistles, the speakers, the testimonies, and we've gone through our share of tissue. Yes. I know I have. Women's Month, went, Women's Month went from being one day to one week to a month. Yes. Yes. We've learned the first week of February when Mother Pertle instructed us that we would be speaking. <laughs> so I immediately went over to Mother Pertle after service and I asked her if I could put myself to the back of the program, uh, back of the month, because of my surgery. So I don't think I can get any further <laughs> back to the end of the month than being the last speaker today. Right. And Mother Bird has that honor. Yes, yes. I, uh, my story today is going to be one of celebration, one of hurt, one of disappointment, one of joy, one of embarrassment, and how God's grace and mercy has kept me. Along with the help of my husband, Who's brought me through? My, my, I entitled my message, If I Had Known Then What I Know Now. Yes. In high school, um, we, we would get a schedule to tell us what our next class was. So I would always get nervous when I would look at the paper and I saw that I had speech class. Basically because I knew that speech class meant speaking. Yes. And it meant speaking in front of people. Yes. And I would imagine that was the first time that I, uh, I brought doubt uh, upon myself. Doubting myself. Yeah. Doubting that I was able. Doubting that I was good enough to do it. Well. Yes, I thought doubting that I was able to do it, Period. Yet, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, yes. but of power, love, and a sound mind. Yes. Yet, now I realize in him, 
I am enough. In him, I've learned that all I have been, I've learned that in all I have been through, I am a victor and not a victim. I am victorious. I am a survivor. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am all that I I am all that I am because of God's grace and mercy. God has it's sad, it's sad when you can't read your own writing. God has a tendency of picking up a nobody and allowing them to become a somebody in front of everybody without asking anybody. There are six things concerning me that I had to learn to quit. One was fearing change, living in the past. I am horrible and really bad at overthinking, doubting myself, worry, and feeling that I am not enough or not good enough. Like they say, if you're going to pray, don't worry. If you're going to worry, don't pray. God doesn't accept us. God doesn't accept us. I'm sorry. God doesn't expect us to know it all, have it all, do it all, or be it all. But he does want us to trust him through it all. Philippians 4 and 6 tells us, be anxious for nothing. But in all thine ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our path. When we believe that anything and everything is possible, then it becomes possible. But it starts with me. It starts with us. As women, our faith has been influenced by women in the Bible, our mothers, our grandmothers, women whom we admire and have made an impact on our life. When it comes to going to church, we've all heard, come as you are. But we shouldn't stay as we are. Yeah. Yes. We should, have, we should be willing participants in any and all that is going on. I've, I've participated in the past in outreach ministry, in feeding the homeless, and ministry of helps. I was a Sunday school teacher for the kids for two years. I believe a little more than two years, less than three. And, and I've had my fair share. I, I'm one of those people who, you give me a pair of gloves and I will do anything. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've, in him I've learned to acknowledge God in and before all things. Everything that we have is by the grace of God. Yeah. Let's pray for one another yes. and put God first. And while we're praying, let's pray for Letitia James. Yes. Letitia James is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the New York State's attorney. Yes. And she is the one who is taking Donald Trump, has taken Donald Trump to court. Yes. And it's a matter of tomorrow is a big day for, for Letitia James and what's going to happen as far as this court hearing with Donald Trump and whether or not he comes up with this money. I just feel like, you know, according to some people, she's, you know, the worst person in the world right now going against Trump to some people. And I, I, I just fear for her. I just pray for her life and her safety. And also Fonnie Willis. Fonnie Willis is the district attorney for Fulton DA in Georgia, who's also taken Trump to court. And we also found out this morning that uh, Princess, uh, Princess Kate has cancer. Yes. So we want to pray for her because if, I don't know if any of you saw her on TV this morning, but you can tell when you look at her that, that, that she is sick. Yeah. So um, I am happy to be a, a, a part of Grace family, a woman of grace. I, uh, when I got the invitation to come to Grace, uh, she probably forgot she gave it to me. <laughs> I didn't show up for two weeks after that I was given the invitation. And then when I showed, then that when I did show up, 
I uh, wanted to turn around, basically because I saw that I had pants on and, and uh, nobody else had pants on. So I was like, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> so uh, I, she, you know, she told me to sit down and have a seat. <laughs> yeah. So um, as I told you, um, uh, my uh, story was going to involve celebration, hurt. Uh, for cel I'll start with celebration. And the celebration would be I get my, the birth, my birthday. The world celebrates with me because my birthday is January 1st. And then there is the birth of my children. I have a 28-year-old, a I'm sorry. <laughs> she probably wished she was 28. I have a 38-year-old, I have a 38-year-old beautician. I have a 38-year-old beautician. Her name's Ashley. Uh, she can do anything with anybody's hair but mine. I have a, uh, I have a, she's going to be 35-year-old Ebony. She's a nurse. I have four grandsons, two granddaughters, and I love them all. Okay, uh, when it comes to hurt, um, I'll start and I'll go with my first episode of hurt most likely was in the 70s. I was a member of a church um, it was a CME church, uh, church period. I mean, I've, I've been at Baptist, I've been at CME, yeah. I've been at Church of God in Christ. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This was a, C, it was a CME church. I won't call names, of, of course. But at this church, there was a, the pastor of the church. And he, for some reason, well, he wasn't the man that he should be. And he made inappropriate uh, gestures, advances, and I will never forget the day that he uh, he cornered me uh, in the basement of the church. And I guess it would have been a thing of if your if your game is give been game on, you know. So I never told uh, my parents about that. I never told anybody about it. I told my friends uh, at the church, and I simply I just left the church. I, I walked away from that church, and I left that church. And the sad part is he had a beautiful wife. He had a beautiful son. He had a beautiful daughter. It was, it, it was just inappropriate. He did wind up leaving the state of Illinois, going to another state. But the point is, are you doing the same things at, that, at another state at, that you were at that church? And it, I also, um, in the late 70s, I was also raped. I was not raped by a stranger. I was raped by someone I knew. Um, I, I, he was not uh, someone that I was interested in having a relationship with. He, um, basically I was raped because I said no. So because I said no, I was held down with a stick across my neck. Uh, until he left my house, and then uh, uh, the next day, because of the time, I took myself to the doctor, and thank God that everything with me was okay. Also, in the, in the late 70s, I, uh, I went to a so-called beautician, and she had four customers. Well, she had five customers. She was the only one there, no shampoo girl or anything. So I told her that my scalp was burning. And I told her again, my scalp is burning. So by the time we finally got over to the sink, my hair went down the sink with the shampoo. So um, that was devastating for me. And my husband was the type of person who I could not go home and tell him or show him my head because I was worried about her and her life and what he would have done to her because that's the type, type of person he was. I was in a, a very abusive relationship um, with my first husband who is now deceased. Uh, he, there's, yes, I had what, iron thrown at me, a fan thrown at me. I was, I've been burned on my legs with a curling iron. I've been beat with a belt and I've had a shotgun held to my temple. And thank God I'm still here. Yes. And I do have some dis I do have some disappointments, 
The disappointments are, are, I'm disappointed in myself, basically. I'm disappointed in myself because I did go to college from 1976 to 1978. And um, I did not finish. That's, I'm disappointed in the fact that I did not finish. I went to college for social justice because uh, in watching these TV shows, I, I had it in my mind that I was going to be a, a forensic pathologist. Mm. So that, that dream died. And um, I, I, I really wish I had finished school, but I did wind up going into health care, which I did for 49 years. The longest I was ever on a job was 22 years for nurse finders. And uh, it's an agency, and I work for nurse finders in two different states. Um, but uh, I work for nurse finders, and I, I did go to school for my, I did get my phlebotomy to draw blood. And I, uh, I went to school for a med tech. I spent four years just doing nothing but uh, passing pills, and I, and I am physical and occupational therapy certified. I'm also disappointed in the fact that I went to the Army, but I didn't get the chance to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to go regular Army. They did not approve me for regular Army, only because I told the truth. And I told, when I told them that I was diagnosed with tiny ulcerations of the colon, for that reason, and that reason alone, they only allowed me to go into the reserves. But I didn't think there was a serious enough reason for them to not allow me to go regular army, but they did. Okay, enjoy. 2019. Uh, 2019 is when I started dating Emmanuel Carter Jr. <laughs> and so we dated. We dated for we dated for a year. We dated for one year. Before we got married, we, we started talking in January of 2019. We got married January 3rd of 2020. And uh, actually, it's actually the best time and the best I've been in my life since I've been with my husband. Yeah. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm sure, all right, all right. I'm, sure I'm the best thing that's ever happened to him. Yeah. Um, so we... We got married January 3rd, and January 4th, we went to Hawaii and stayed. And I came back on, on January, I'm sorry, on February, in February, I took, I was taking care of a friend, and I took her to, I took her to Florida, I'm, no, New Jersey, thank you. I took her to New Jersey to, uh, to help her in burying her brother. And we're talking about February 2020. February of 2020 is when COVID really started. And um, when I got there, actually we, we flew into, we were, we were also in New York. And if you remember, COVID was really prevalent. It was awful in, in, in the state of in New York, okay? So when I got there, I was sick. When I got there, I had cold symptoms. And basically, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, when I came home, I was still sick. My husband had went to Grenada to his mother's, to my mother-in-law's house, and that night, I couldn't breathe. I, I had trouble breathing, I couldn't breathe, and I didn't know what was going on with me. I just prayed because I didn't want to call the ambulance for myself. I had trouble breathing, and basically, from then on, I was just sick. If I had COVID, I don't know I had COVID, basically because they hadn't diagnosed COVID. They didn't know what COVID was then. So if I had COVID then, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've taken probably, and working in healthcare, I've taken probably since COVID started, <laughs> just short maybe of 20 COVID tests. Anytime I felt sick, I went to take a COVID test. For the job, I had to take COVID tests. They just kept sending me for COVID tests. So I've never been diagnosed with COVID. Every test that I had after COVID came out, came out negative. Um, 
for some reason, I started stuttering and I stuttered every day for at least six months. And then it just stopped. My, my mother was telling me, I, I can tell that your speech is getting better because your stuttering is getting better. So I was stuttering. I was taking this medicine. Some people call it naproxen. Some people say naproxen. I think I, I pronounce it naproxen. Now it's pronounced one way or the other. That particular medication made me sick. I seemed to get sick every day. Around 6 o'clock, it was like 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., boom. It's like every day I was sick, so I told the doctor that I could no longer, I no longer wanted to take that medicine because it was really doing me bad. I um, wound up having, still in the month of February, I, I had a stroke in my left eye, which makes, I have zero problem reading up close, but my, I'm, I'm farsighted. I can't see far away, period. Uh, Reading and up close, I have no problems with, but I, I had a stroke in my left eye. I've it had two. I've had three TIAs. I've had a, a major stroke in '89 that had nothing to do with health care. Health period. I mean, it, that had to do with my husband, but I've had plenty of sickness and basically I was so sick to the point where I was. Lo I went out looking for health insurance. I went out looking for health insurance, and we had this stuff called Marketplace, but it was like 400 and some odd dollars, my payment was, and I, that, it was too much for, for, I wasn't working, and my husband was already paying every bill there was to pay, so I had a job at the hospital, and this part, now I'm to the point of talking about how and this is my last subject, embarrassment. And I struggled with whether I was going to bring it up or not, or whether I was going to mention it or not, basically because I'm ashamed of it and embarrassed by it. But um, in looking for health care, I, uh, I went back to the hospital that I was working at. And uh, the church I was going to, and it was a it was a koji. It was Church of God in Christ. The church we were going to. The lady that worked there was worked at the hospital, and she helped me to get a job there. And I had I worked there for a couple of years, and I left. I went to Alabama. I came back. I needed health insurance. I was so sick. I, I it's it's sad. It's bad when you're going to the hospital or the emergency room, yet you don't have any insurance, so you know that you're going to get that bill. So I, uh, I went back to the hospital, and before I went, I had taken a, a candy cane. What is it? I took, I took a popcorn machine and a, I'm, I can't think of the name of the machine, cotton candy, I'm sorry, a cotton candy machine to a friend who was having a party. This is, a, this is a, a, the end of 2020, uh, October to be exact. Um, even though it was four years ago, I'm still, I, I'll go to my grave being embarrassed by this. Um, the bottom of it was dirty. The inside was clean, the bottom of it was dirty. So I went to her sink. She went downstairs. I imagine if she was up there, it wouldn't have happened. She went downstairs to, put, to transfer clothes to the washing machine. So I went over to the sink. I washed my hands. I dried my hands. I looked in a bowl right here. It had something in it, cellophane, red cellophane paper with ties around it. So I opened it up and I was happy because it was a brownie and I love brownies. So I ate the brownie and I, it was gummy. So I was wondering why is this, why is it tasting, why is it gummy? Yet I was hungry, reason why I opened it and ate it anyway. I was hungry, I ate it. I ate another one. She comes upstairs. Uh, why did you eat that? Those, those, uh, those brownies had THC in them. So, yes. So basically, the, um, the same day I got home, the hospital called. Tell me to come in, do my drug test. Yeah, you all know what's happening before I did. Yeah. I mean, um, if gummies were out in 2020... 
I basically, I didn't know about it because I wasn't hanging around that type of thing. So um, I ate the brownies. I, I, they called me for the, to come in to be tested. I went in to be tested. I had to go to the bathroom anyway. I happily took that cup. I went in and to uh, bring my sample back. And about three days later, I get a phone call telling me that I didn't pass the test. And so I, uh, they told me, they said, well, it's only, I forget how many, it's only nine, I forget how many percent he said it was off. But he said, well, you can come back in and we will retest you. And I did call. I called to come back in and be retested. But they did not, they did not answer. They didn't, they didn't call me back. I left messages. They didn't call me back. I guess they were really upset. And so was I and disappointed. And so was I because COVID was out and I could have immediately started work and they needed me. And I had already worked there before and I knew the ropes. So it was, I didn't try to embarrass the woman at the church, which the woman at the church went back and told everybody that I had failed the test. And yes, I found out that yes, I could have got her fired uh, for, because of the HIPAA law. Um, but uh, God would not have me to do that. I, I, I went through that and also falling out with a girl that was at the church who was a friend of the pastor. So every time she walked into church, the pastor would look at me and watch her and, and watch how we interacted with each other. And I thought that was just absolutely ridiculous. That was not, uh, yeah. So basically I left that church. We left that church, uh, which they, I mean, I really wish that things had went different, baby, basically because they lost the church van driver. They lost their handyman. They lost the handyman for their house. They lost an usher. And I didn't feel good about that period. Um, of course, we didn't have to leave the church. Uh, we just decided to. I decided to. I, I, I actually tried to talk my husband into continuing to stay there and continue to go church there. And that was his choice to not return. But we did go to, a, we did find another church that I loved and I really wanted to join that church. We did not join that church because we were moving and we were coming here. Although I wanted to join every Sunday. <laughs> we still, we, we, we didn't join that church because we were moving. So um, basically that, that is the end of me talking. I, I probably have talked for too long. And if I did, I'm sorry, but I'm done now. And some use, it's all yours. <laughs> Good morning, Grace. Um, I don't even know where to start. We're going to pray first because we got to get these nerves together. But Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for everybody making it here in one piece. Um, I just ask you to continue to protect us, keep us under your will, like only you know how to. Amen. Amen. So, Mother Purtle texts me. Told me, y'all, not asked, told me <laughs> that um, I was going to be on the program. So she gave me the details, been trying to figure out, you know, what to say, how to say it, where to start, um, and realizing that since I don't really say so much, I don't wrote out like 10 pages worth of stuff. <laughs> But um, look, if we want to make it to dinner, I ain't gonna, um, I ain't gonna be before y'all too long. But um, we can go ahead and get started. So my verse is First John five or two verses, First John five fourteen and fifteen. And this is the confidence I have in Him 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. Now, the according to his will part is the gag. Because if it's not his will, it ain't going to happen. Um, so you have to be... Hold on, let me not lose myself. You have to be able to still praise and worship the Lord even when his answer is no. Yes. Yep. Right. So, we're going to um, skim through a lot of this story. But the last five years of my life alone, y'all, have been the biggest reason for me. Like, the biggest transformation of my life. Yes. <sighs> like... I've always known God. I've always, you know, been in church. I can sing every gospel song. I can quote you a whole lot of, you know, verses. I can do all this stuff. But I never felt like I was good enough, if you will, to do this, to be up here, to, you know, tell the word, to speak about how good God is because of, you know, so many worldly reasons. But the same energy that I have, when I listen to Master P or, you know, whoever else, yeah. I can have that energy and more for my God because he has done a whole, whole lot for me. So, let's see. So, my life started all over again, or I was reborn when I was broken. I lost my dad April 30th of 2019. <laughs> And, like, my dad was my guy, y'all. Like, jokes, hot wings, whatever, you name it, it was us, okay? Dancing, it, anything. So that just, I didn't know how my life was going to go on, to be quite honest with you. Um, that was just a real, that was a real, a mighty blow for me. Um... So in the midst of that, dealing with that, thinking that I'm depressed, um, and that's why my body's feeling a little crazy, I go to the doctor and find out that I'm pregnant. And this is after being told by the same doctor that I would never be able to have children. So I find out I'm pregnant, and you know how the old folks say, now you can't have no sad baby. So I had to kind of, you know, pull myself up, you know, put my... Put my grief, my heartache, all that type of stuff in my back pocket because, again, we can't have no sad baby. And the way he be running around here, y'all see he ain't no sad baby. Um, so between that, got engaged, uh, me and my ex. Uh, we had a, got a nice little townhouse. Baby, I thought we was going to start this family, you know. And then it was going to be it. I was going to finally get, finally get married, Okay. Finally, I thought, I thought it was it for me, but it wasn't God's will. God said that ain't it. And one thing that we have to know about God saying that this is not it is knowing that he has something better. Okay, so after having my son, I... um. I know I realized when I was kind of going into postpartum depression um, and what triggered it, y'all. I drove past my church's old building and there were some particular people at that church that used to bully me real bad. And one girl in particular, one, one thing I remember in particular about one girl is that she would stick me with stick pins. And y'all, now listen, because I wanted to swing on her. I wanted to, and I was about to. But right, the hard, the, what stopped me, y'all, we was in church. We, you know, we on the usher board, all that stuff. And it's like, I can't swing on her in the church. Because I swing on her in the church. You know. <laughs> so, you know, we couldn't do that. But that just like really triggered me and made me kind of realize that I needed to heal a lot of things that I had buried in the closet of my life. Um, so I get ready to start therapy, y'all. 
before I can even start therapy for, you know, just like grief and just getting myself all the way together, because my, my main reason for getting myself together is to not pass on anything that can be harmful or, you know, affect my son in any, any type of negative way. Um, so before I can even start for that and grief is when my baby, not my baby dad, I'm sorry, y'all, is when my son's father, <laughs> um, you know, he just, he lost his mind. We ain't gonna go into details on that, but we just gonna say he lost his mind. Um, and it was at that point for me that something just kind of clicked, like, again, this ain't God's will. Like, ain't no working it out, ain't no, ain't no apologies, there's nothing that can fix this. So I had to move. Um, so I moved, y'all, and as freeing as moving, you know, in your own place can be, I still felt broken because it's like, you know, now I'm a statistic, I'm a, you know, I'm a single mama type thing. Then I got to pay all these bills by myself. Like every last one of them, y'all, every last one of them. So it's just like, Lord, I'm like, Lord, what is we going to do next? Because, again, I've always known the Lord. So I, I, it's like a part of me that knows that everything is always going to be okay. But I be mad sometimes. So I got to cry a little bit. I got to, you know, get it off me. But in all of those things, I learned that or I just I felt so broken and so defeated. And I thought I had lost everything and was starting all over again. But that's the goodness of God because... I thought that I lost everything, but he was giving me the opportunity to start over. He was giving me the opportunity to start, you know, a, a fresh new life. This is when I really start, you know, clinging to the Lord. Um, talk, talking to him. I, sometimes I feel like I get on his nerves, y'all, because anytime something go on, it's like, now what now? So... <laughs> So, I'm just glad today to be able to stand before you all and say that I am no longer bound. God is calling me out of my safe space. And one thing for sure I've come to know in this life is that God will take care of me. No matter what it looks like, God will prevail in my life and he shows me that time after time. Everything we go through helps cultivate our faith. Isaiah 26 and 3 states, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. So this is my grandmama's favorite verse, y'all. And, you know, she, she don't say the whole verse, but she'll tell you, baby, keep your mind stayed on Jesus. So that's the one thing, like, through everything or anything that may come my way, as hard as it may be sometimes, I make sure that I keep my mind stayed on Jesus. Um, so I encourage everyone here today to be anxious for nothing. Keep your mind stayed on him. Know that the Lord will not fail you. You couldn't drown if you tried. When you fix your focus, it fixes your faith, and that helps you fix your life. You can't have big faith and small thinking. I have one more story, and then I'm going to be done. But um, So when I was in the fourth grade, so with my healing, you know, when you, when you really start doing it and you go to therapy, it, like, it unloads stuff that you probably think you forgot about. So one story from the fourth grade, um, and I feel like this was almost maybe the first time that I felt defeat. And my uh, teacher, she was calling out for, you know, everybody that got the honor roll. I'm waiting because I know I got the honor roll, okay? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. She ain't never called my name. I'm like, dog. I must have got to see or something. What did I got to see in? I'm, you know, I'm just like, well, you know, maybe next time. But she hadn't called the principal's list yet. Soon as she started calling the principal's list, y'all, my name was the first name she called. I must have hopped up at that chair like, okay, okay. And that's just something, again, that I... um that I carry with me now, like, don't think the worst just because you get a no on something. Don't think the worst just because there's a delay. There's always something better, and God will always take care of you.
Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we bless you. God, we thank you. Father, we exalt your name. God, we magnify you. Father, we make you great. God, we make you big. God, we thank you for every testimony. God, we thank you for every victory. God, we thank you because we can call on you. And when we call, you'll answer. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we bless your name. Hallelujah. Let's go. 
Jesus. Come on and help us call him Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on and help us call him up. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Bridge over trouble water, Jesus. My healer, Jesus. My doctor, Jesus. My intercessor, Jesus. My lawyer, Jesus. My protector, Jesus. My shepherd, Jesus. My doctor, Jesus. My teacher, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, I thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because you're Lord over my life. You run the show. You're Lord over my life. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I can't do it without you, Jesus. I can't walk without you, Jesus. I can't breathe without you, Jesus. I can't talk without you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lily of the valley, Jesus. Bright and morning star, Jesus. God of every nation, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Demon tremble. When you call on Jesus, sickness got to go when you call on Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Act like you done shown up for you before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Act like you done healed you before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Act like he's provided before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Act like he's fought for you before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Act like he's covered you before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
okay. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. We good. We are right. Glory to God. Bless his holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ah, oh, let us pray. Father God, I just thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you. We bless your name. Father, we want to give you all the glory, all the honor. Continue to have your way, God. Continue to have your way, God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you for every word and song that has gone forth at this time. We thank you, Lord God. Oh, God, I thank you for everything that has happened on my way to this spot today. Oh, Father, I thank you for everything that has transpired and all that you've brought me through. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all these wonderful testimonies and epistles and sermons, oh, God, that we've heard up to this point. God, I thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful Women's Month. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for Mother Lee. Thank you for Mother Pearl and all that had a hand in making this day, this month, what it has been. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good to us already, God. We just thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We just want to honor you today, God. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to the Lord. You all may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're supposed to let Trevor know at least a few days. I don't know. I forgot what the actual protocol is of what hour by Friday. Okay. So, I didn't know on Friday. So, I couldn't tell Trevor. <laughs> I did not know on Friday. It just had been swarming around in my head ever since uh, Mother Perla said, be ready. And I, and I didn't get a text, per se. I saw the, I saw the itinerary. And I was like, what? <laughs> she ain't told me nothing. <laughs> Pastor, we'll give you a phone call or something, you know what I'm saying. That's all right. God is good. So I saw that early on, probably, you know, it's been out for a month or something. And I was like, okay, God, I don't know. You know, as somebody who talks all the time, you always got something to say. But you want to make sure you're saying what does say the Lord and what is appropriate for this time. So I didn't know. And I wrestled with it. I know in him I am enough. That's our theme. I know our theme scripture. First Peter 5 and 10. But as of 1051 p.m. last night, I was like, okay. So this is what I sat down and wrote to the to my father. I said, Father. I can't seem to put anything down on paper. I have thought, prayed, researched, and searched for what to talk about. I say, I humbly ask you to just let me glorify you. I have been consumed with thoughts about how, how in you, with you, and because of you, I am enough. I've looked back over my life. From childhood to this present moment, I've recalled that over the years, I have often thought about all the bad things that I have experienced in my life. <sighs> years ago, I started a list of what we now know as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. PSTD moments, PTSD moments, all of these things that I have endured. So as I was looking through 
the notes that Mother Perla had put together for us to try to help us. You know, like when you teach English, sometimes you tell children to write a paper, but you give them a sentence stem or you give them a start. So she gave us a lot of information to help us. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Perla. <laughs> and so she had compiled a list of the names of God in some of that work that she had done and given to us. And it took me back to a list that I started some years ago, but I didn't quite finish it, but I started it. And it was like, because I, I, I tell people sometimes, I say, okay, anything that anybody you could possibly think of that can have an adverse effect on your life, I've been through it from A to Z. Mm. <laughs> so as I was looking at Mother's List, she actually had the names of God from A to Z. And I was like, wow, I didn't know there was a Z. <laughs> I didn't know there was a you, in, you know, for God's name. But um, so as I compared her list to my list, I realized that for every adversity, there is a name to call on. <laughs> that can rescue me, that has rescued me, that continues to rescue me from any and every situation and circumstance. So, as part of, and maybe it'll be all of, I don't know, my message today, I am going to share my list. It ain't pretty. <laughs> On the one side. But there's a flip side. Now, I want to say this. This is my disclaimer. This is what I call it anyway, but it's a scripture. And this is my disclaimer this morning. Is that we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I have to go back up to see where I got this from. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So with all these things that I, I, I used to ponder about, why did this happen and why did that happen and why do I have to go through this and why, why and why? But this I know. It's one of Mother Pearl's stems for us. This I know. <laughs> that in him, I am enough. As I have been abused, betrayed, cast down, disappointed, envied, forsaken, had gloomy days, I've been homeless, I've been ill-spoken of, I've been judged and joyless, kidnapped, left, molested, neglected, oppressed, in pain, questioned, reviled, and raped, sad, tired, tempted, and terrified, unloved, unstable, unhappy, ungrateful, vexed, violent, vulnerable, wicked, and weak. I've been xenophobic, and I've been X-rated. 
I've been yearning and I've often felt like a zero. But all of that has brought me to know that because Jesus is more than enough, I am enough. The name of God that I want to talk about, or the one that I chose, and I've often chosen it as my personal name for God, and that is Jehovah Jireh. It's very common. We all say it all the time. That it's the God who provides. But there's more to it than just supplying our needs, just making provisions for us. There's more to Jireh than just provider. Financially, that's what we mostly think of. When the rent got to be paid, when we got to buy grocery, MLGW, that's what we think of, Jehovah Jireh. But I was reminded of the first time that Jehovah Jireh was mentioned. I believe it's the first time you real Bible scholars can help me with that. But I recall that it was in Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham was given the instruction to sacrifice his son that he had waited for for a long time. He finally gets the promise. And God says, I want him. (laughs) And we know the story, how that Abraham being obedient by faith, he went ahead and proceeded to get up, I want to say early in the morning, and take his son to the mountaintop to worship God, but Isaac was the sacrifice. But provide, as we know the end of the story, and we, and we get the term a ram in the bush, God always has a ram in the bush. And so just as Abraham was be about to, he had drawn the knife. He had tied him up and laid him on the altar. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Abram and said, do not harm your son. I know now that you love me above everything. And Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, where he was. Because God provided, because he looked around and he and saw that there was a perfect sacrifice, a ram that was stuck in the thickets of a bush. And as I said, there are so much, there is so much more descriptions for provide, for gyra. One is in Hebrew, it's also see to it. Jehovah will see to it. That interpretation is similar to what happened with Hagar as she called upon the Lord in Genesis chapter 16. And she says, the God who sees, not only does he see, but he perceives. Not only does he perceive what we're going through, but he actually understands. He actually experiences right along with us. When God calls God, when Abraham calls God Jehovah Jireh, he isn't just saying God gives the goods. He is saying, you, God, you see, you experience all of this need of mine. 
and you make provision for it. It's deeply personal. God's provision isn't automated like my paycheck that goes through direct deposit into my bank account. And it isn't far removed as if he doesn't feel the need. He understands. He saw. He loved. And so he gave. The passage of scripture is one of the clearest foreshadowing stories of the work of Jesus Christ. God not only provided for Abraham, but he also provided his son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Jesus is the provision. While God amazingly provided the big needs like eternity, he is also present in the little needs. Provision is in the daily details. It's so ironic that in this story, after all of that happened with Abraham and Isaac, the next thing that is talked about in the Bible is a genealogist. So they begin to give a list of the genealogy of Abraham on down, on down, letting us know that every Isaac, God knew everything. So even Isaac was going to live because he had planned for Isaac's future wife because he mentioned her family in the genealogy. So he already knew everything. God has a plan for us, for our life, for everything that we have gone through, for all of the lists that I have. As I said, there's also a flip side to that because God does not leave us where he finds us. Praise God for that. He does not leave us where he finds us. I just gave you a list of A to Z for things that I was all of those things by the time God found me, and I was only 16. (laughs) I had lived a whole lot of life by the time I was 16. This sounds God true. Some of those things happened to me after I was saved, as a matter of fact. I got saved at 16. But some of those things, like being kidnapped, I was saved. (laughs) Like being raped, I was raped before I got saved, I was raped after I got saved. I'm like, Lord, what is really going on here? What is is happening? How does this happen? But in everything that God does, it's to make us who he wants us to be. So I loved listening to Sister Carter today. And to Tisa today, because, and, and all of the ones that have spoken, but since this is fresh in our mind, we can, we can relate to this right now. That how everything that we go through, as bad as those things seem to be, as devastating as those moments are or were, as embarrassing as all of that was, God's will has been done. Because I'm who I am. If anything had not been done, if I had not experienced any one of those things, I don't know if I would be who I am. And I like me. (laughs) I I like me. I, I, I like me because of what Jesus has done. He has replaced that list, but I don't forget it. Because it reminds me to continue to humbly wait on God, to humbly walk before him, to humbly encounter other people. You know, I I know so much stuff. I really do. I know a lot of stuff. And a lot of it is from experience. You know, I've had people ask me, they was like, 
Why do you talk so boldly the way you do? Why, why do you, you know, why do you just have to be so blunt all the time? Okay, I don't know exactly the answer to all of those things, those questions, but I do know that I come from a confident place. I come from a place that I know what I'm talking about because God has taken me through these things. So I don't say stuff that I don't know anything about. So when I talk to somebody about whatever, they say, oh, you think you know everything? Well, not quite, but I know a lot of stuff because I've had a lot of experiences. It's like I tell them at school, I'm 66 years old, so I've had a lot of experience in a lot of different things, good, bad, ugly, wonderful, all of that, and it all has made me who I am. I used to be ashamed that I know so much. (laughs) I didn't want to know all this stuff. I used to be ashamed, and some stuff God just pours in me. I didn't ask for stuff. I didn't study for stuff. I didn't snoop around to try to find out stuff. He just give you dreams. He wake you up in the middle of the night with all these epiphanies. And it's like, really? Why do I need to know that? And then you find out later on when you encounter somebody that has a need. Well, that's why you need to know that. Because I'm always coming in contact with people that have the experiences that I have experienced. So you've been homeless? Okay. You can get through that. How do I know? Been there, done that. (laughs) You know, okay. So your uncle molested you? Okay. You can survive that. How do I know? I can speak boldly and confidence about these things because I've been there. So you've been divorced? So I had a girlfriend tell me at her birthday party. I think it was late last year. And so we're having a good time at her birthday party. And I walk up to greet her, and she says, Bird, you know, you know I got divorced. She, had, she hadn't been married that long. I said, girl, I've done that three times. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and with tears in her eyes, she just started laughing, you know, because she was like, only you. You are so crazy. But it, I'm like, girl, call me. <laughs> we can talk about it. You can survive that. She waited so long to get married. I think that's probably to get married again. She had been married once, and then she had waited a long time before she got married again, and so only for it to not last long. And I was like, baby, it happens, but we survive by the grace of God. So we we have these experiences, and... Yes, at the moment, they may be embarrassed, but I want to say to Sister Carter, you're not going to be embarrassed the rest of your life. God replaces embarrassment (laughs) with excitement, with exuberance, some other E word, but it won't be embarrassment because you you will begin to see why that happened. Maybe that job just really wasn't for you. Maybe you needed to just be graceful in that moment to the lady at church, to the one that made the edibles, whatever. But you've shown them something different. Even when they look at you at church and remember, oh, look at her. Yeah, I remember she did, blah, blah, blah. Oh, she failed the drug test. Okay, so what? I'm not the first person, not the last person. It happens. And you survive. And you're better for it. And we have you here with us now. (laughs) So God was working that thing. We don't always know how he's working, but he's always working. And and things look terrible. Things look uh, horrifying. They just look like I'm never going to be anything other than abused, betrayed cast down, and da 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 But he says, no. Now when Jesus comes, when I accepted him as my Savior, even at 16, and even since then, I've gone through some of these bad things. And good things still happen to save people. Bad things also happen to save people. <laughs> we got Jesus so we can handle it. Even better than we could without him. 
And this is what I say to people when they say, well, what's the point in being with Jesus if you're still going to go through bad things? Baby, have you, have you gone through bad things without him? <laughs> it's a vast difference when you go through bad things with him. Your hope is up, your confidence, your faith. You already know that you're going to win. You just got to go through the process. You just got to go through what he's taking you through, and then he's walking with you. So when you get to your new list, you find that from A to to Z, you are adored. You are beautiful. You are confident. You are delightful. You are efficient. You are fulfilled. You are gorgeous. You are joyful. You can be kind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can be kind when you used to be mean because of the things that you've gone through. But now you can be You can be loving. You're marvelous. You're nurtured. You now walk in the newness of life. No matter how neglected you have been, now you are in the newness of life. Oppressed? Yes, I was but I'm an overcomer. Pathetic? (laughs) Yes, but God says I'm priceless. Question and quixotic, but I'm a queen. Pooh. Reviled, repugnant, raped. Yes, but I am royally redeemed. Sad and sullen, but I have risen strong. Stable. Tired, tempted, terrified. But now I'm trustworthy. And I'm thankful. Unloved, unstable, unhappy. (laughs) Made me unique. (laughs) These are the things that my father gave me at 10.51 p.m. He said, you got to finish this list, girl. (laughs) Oh, God. I was like, Lord, I just want to go to sleep. (laughs) Wake up in the morning and find out it was a bad dream. I don't have to speak after all. (laughs) My Lord, wicked and weak, even worrisome at times. I know I've gotten on some of y'all nerve. But I'm a wise winner. I am. I used to be ashamed to say that I have the gift of wisdom. But it comes from God. I didn't do it. I didn't give it to myself. I don't have that ability. So I can't be ashamed anymore of the things that God has given me. And you should not be ashamed of the things that God has given you. And don't be ashamed of the way that he gave them to you. It was not your choosing to even be born. I remember my mama told me one time. She said, I don't know why she, I don't know if she was mad at me, and I've probably said this before or whatever, but, you know, me and my mama had the typical, it may not be so typical, but a lot of first daughters have a kind of love-hate thing with their mom sometimes, and maybe daughters in general, but I was a first daughter. And so it was like, this lady does not like me. She hates me. I know she does. And she thought I hated her for a long time, too. But, But we loved each other. And sometimes... I open my mouth, and she just comes right out. She's my mom, she's just right. <laughs> I'm serious about that. But she told me one time, she was like, I don't even know why 
I had you because, you know, I almost aborted you. I was a child, you know, I was a little girl, but I was like always something different. So I, I realized as I thought about my mom and, and my relationship that she didn't know what to do with me because I asked too many questions. I spoke my mind too much. I said stuff that children shouldn't say, you know, not like cuss words and stuff, but I'm just like, hey, why is this happening? You know, whatever. So like when she said she should have aborted me, what would I have known? So that's what I'm like, okay, lady, why didn't you? What would, that, what would it mean to me at this point? You know, <laughs> that's that kind of stuff. So she was like, who is this girl? Like, what's wrong with this child? You know, why didn't she bust out crying when I said that? But no, I'm just like, make you think, lady. Why you? But I'm here now, so what are we going to do? <laughs> Might as well have a party, right? And my birthday is January 5th. <laughs> so you know how we are, <laughs> Mother Carter. You know how we are. And my mom's birthday was January, was December 31st. So you know what we're dealing with. Bless her heart. May God rest her soul. Oh, God. And so, from being xenophobic to being xenial. Y'all can look these words up. You know, I, I love words, so I just, like, got a list of words in a notebook. I do. And I look up words all the time. All the games on my phone are word games. They're crossword puzzles. They'll find the word. They'll make a word. You know, it's ridiculous, but... That's what I do. I used to be yearning for so much, longing for so much, longing to understand, longing to be loved, longing to be accepted, longing to, for somebody to like me, oh, just longing to be. But now, I just yield all this stuff to God. I just gave it to him, and I just yield before him. I get up every day, and I just say, Lord, whatever is going to come my way today, just be with me and help me to glorify you. Because this, at this point, I mean, what is, else is there to do? Yeah, I heard the list. I've done it all. I've done it all. <laughs> There's nothing else to do but to glorify him. There's nothing else to do but yield to him. And because of that, God has given me, he's renewed my strength. He's given me, I like to say, a youthfulness. That's why I tell the children at school, they always like, like they so surprised when they talk about age. And they always want to, Miss Bird, how old are you? I say, I'm 66, baby. How many times are you going to ask me that? Miss Bird, we forget. You don't seem like you're 66. I'm like, right, because I'm youthful. And I've gone from being a zero to being zealous. The zeal of the Lord has anointed me. And even after this today, I've confessed so much stuff, so y'all know I'm going to be different, right? <laughs> it's on now, I'm telling you right now. It's just, you know, so you know who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm transparent anyway. But there are just still a lot of things that people don't know about you. They think that you're so strong, but they don't know why. They don't know why. So I just felt like they need to know why. Why I speak with such a boldness. Why I speak with such a confidence. Because I know that if God brought me through all this A to Z stuff, what is it that I, he can't do? What is it that we can't get through? With God providing, he does not just provide money. He does not just supply our needs to pay our bills and to have clothes on our back. He gives us strength. He gives us grace. He has given us mercy. He, give, he crowns us with wisdom to know how to go to and fro among any people. Any people. My mom used to always tell us, she was like, Okay, all that slang and stuff, that's good. And I used to, and I told my children the same thing. But you need to know the king's English. That's what my mama used to say. You need to know the king's English. You need to know how to go 
from the poorhouse to the penthouse. You need to know. And God can give you that. Don't have to be the most educated person. But I will say again, and so Scott, I'm just picking on you because you laid it out there. <laughs> oh, my God. I got two degrees in three years, three years ago, okay? Everybody know that. Struggling. What, what, I'm a lifetime student for real. I started college in the 80s. I got my associate degree, I want to say in 2019 maybe, and then a year later I got my bachelor's degree. Why? Because I had so many credits. So I've been going to school for so long. I'm telling you. So I just told some people, hey, give me a degree. Do I need to change my major to match these hours? <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> you hear me? I'm like, I know I qualify for a degree. I already know because I got enough credits to have a Ph.D. And at that time, I didn't even have an associate degree. And the man at uh, Southwest Tennessee used to be Shelby State. It was Shelby State when I started. Hello. That's a long time ago. He said, well, that's not, we can't make that call at this level. That would be a state board of regents decision. Fine. <laughs> he didn't have to call them. I wrote them a letter. Ma'am, sir, I have all these credits and a copy of my transcript. Check this out. I need a degree from this college. I get a phone call a few days later because I sent them an email. It was hot. I'm telling you now, don't think that because, as we pastor told us this some years ago, delayed but not denied. I, I take that to heart. They have to tell me again that I didn't, I didn't make it. <laughs> that I, they have to tell me again. So, consequently, I get a call from the college. It was like, oh, the State Board of Reasons called and said, blah, blah, blah. And yes, ma'am, we can do that for you. I just got a little checklist I need you to do. Fine. One, two, three. Checked it all off. Did it all. Did, get my diploma in the mail. Hanging on my wall right now. <laughs> Associate of Science. I'm just saying. Then I said, well, Lord, I need to get this bachelor's degree. Because I just feel like I'm going to be doing something after a while. <laughs> and they're going to ask me for it. You know, I've had jobs that said you needed to have it, but they hired me anyway. But I'm like, okay. So I, I went to school. I said, well, I'm just going to go on back to school. I'm going to go back to Lemoyne. I started Lemoyne in 1980, I want to say seven or eight. It, I know it was seven or eight. I don't know which one. Might have been 88, might have been 87. But that's, that's when I started Lamorne. So I go back to Lamorne because I just felt like the Lord was leading me to go back where you started and finish what you started. And so I was, I was like, okay, it's going to take me probably two to three years to go ahead and get this degree in social work. And I was all set to do that. And was taking classes every day. Going to school, I love school. <laughs> yeah, I love school. I was going to school. And one of my professors, who was also the chair, chairman of the department, the social science department, he said, he said, Ms. Bird, I think you can probably go ahead and graduate. <laughs> He's like, I'm not teaching you anything. You already know all this stuff, you, you know. So I think... Have you had your transcript evaluated? I'm like, not recently. He was like, well, I want you to go and see Miss So-and-so. She was uh, over whatever, transcript evaluation or whatever. He said, yeah, I think she can help you, and you can go ahead and get your degree. You don't need any more classes. I was like, what? So I called the lady. I couldn't get in touch with her. 
called her a few times. And I didn't get in touch with her, so I just kept going to class. And so he stopped me after class one day. He was like, did you call uh, Professor so-and-so? I was like, um, I did, but she didn't answer. And she hadn't called me back and yada, yada. So he gets on his cell phone, and he calls her right then and there. He said, I'm sending Miss Bird to your office, and I need you to help her get her transcript in order so that she can graduate. I was like, what? So I went to her office. We literally spent about six to eight hours. That lady took all this time with me to get my transcript because some stuff was like they had to substitute this class for that class and all of this kind of stuff. And then I needed a class that they, well, you got to have a physical activity class. I said, I don't have time for that. So they said, well, you need a doctor's note. So I called Courtney. I said, I need a doctor's note that said I cannot, I cannot do any physical activity at this point in time. I'm old. I already hurt my knee. I got arthritis. You know all these things. Put that stuff in that letter and give it to these folks. <laughs> it's all true. I'm just saying, hey, exempt from that class. They accept this class. Okay, we got it all straightened out. Perfect. Here's your application for, to graduate. Okay, so I, I applied, and I graduated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because I know a lot of stuff. Already taking some classes more than one time. It's like, hmm, this got to come to an end. Lord, help me. And he did. So God provides Jehovah Jireh, whatever it is that we need. He doesn't care about the circumstances. He is the circumstance. He provides. He gives us everything that we need. He's just waiting on us to ask him. He's just waiting on us to accept that he wants to do it, that he can do it, that he will do it, because he's already done it. God already done it. He already saw us. He already loved us. He already gave us Jesus. And the scripture t asks us a question. If God gave us Jesus, what? will he withhold from us what is it that he won't give us he gave his only begotten son what is it that we can ask for that jehovah jireh will not provide absolutely nothing so as i wrap this up I just want to say that God is an amazing God. <sighs> He's a wonderful God. He's a blessed God. He brings us through any and everything. And because he's bringing us through it, so we have to stop looking at, I'm just going through this. No. I used to tell my children, and I have to remind myself, that as a child of God, nothing can happen to you unless he allows it. I don't care what it is. I don't care that it's rape. I'm his child. He allowed it. He can do anything. He could have stopped it. Somebody could have not broken my house because I was at home, minding my own business. But he's a good God. And there are reasons for everything that we go through. And I'll say this quick story, and then we're going to pray and move on. But in terms of bad things that happen to us, so I decided to go to, um, I had been through rape crisis and they had, um, they, they, they tell you about these um, group meetings that you can go through and be with people that have gone through stuff that you've gone through. So it's a long time ago. I don't even remember if it was still in the 70s or coming in the 80s. or I don't know. 
because I got married at 17, so it was sometime after I got married that this stuff happened. But anyway, I went to uh, this church that's still right there on Bellevue, and I think that's Bellevue and Peabody. It's a big church. Uh, I see the St. Luke or St. John, something or another right there. So they were having these um, meetings, uh, group sessions for women that had been uh, raped. And so I went one time. And uh, and I don't know why I never went back because it was a good meeting, but at that time, you know, I was I was still shy. I did used to be shy, and so I I kind of sat in the back of the room, and I wasn't going to say anything. And a young lady uh, got up and she wanted to to just say, "Why do people keep telling her that she needs to ask God to forgive her?" when she did not do anything wrong. And why does she, and so, you know, since she told him what had happened, a family member had uh, raped her, and um, and she still had to see this person, and, you know, this family member, and all these kinds of things. And so everybody began to just say stuff to her, you know, like God is a forgiving God, and it doesn't matter what happened, what you did, God is forgiven, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's not, that's not right. He is, but that's not what she needs to hear. And so I was sitting there, and I was like, Lord, do I have to say something? It's like, you got to say something. <laughs> so I, I finally I raised my hand. I was like, look. Lady, young lady, she was very young. We might have been about the same age because I was very young too at the time. I was in my twenties, and I just told her I was like, "All this stuff right here, what it is, is that you need to forgive." That's the thing. You need to forgive. That's what's gonna free you. And I knew that because that's what I had to do. I had to forgive family members. I had to forgive a uh, neighborhood friend, neighborhood bully. Uh, but God takes care of all these things. <clears throat> I had to forgive an unknown person because I never knew or saw the person that broke in our apartment after me and my husband and were married and we had our children. Some of our children were born at the time. And so I never knew who that person was, but I still had to, the strength that I had to overcome and take my life back was forgiveness. And that's what the Lord led me to say to her. In that moment, my whys about that thing were answered. Why did that happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Why? And it was for her that it happened to me. I tell pastor all the time that some things have happened to him that were for me. You know, pastor and I, we've lost some jobs, you know what I'm saying. So he would go first and then it'd be my turn. And you know, <laughs> pastor lost the house, then I lost the house. It was like, okay, what's that? I told him, I said, you, you go before me. So I thank God for that. You show me how to walk through it. So we, we go through things for those that we're going to encounter. We go through things that for those that we're going to help. It's never just about us. It's never just about me. It's never just about you. It's about those that are coming behind you or those that you are going to encounter so that you will have the story that they need to hear in order for them to get over the thing that is killing them. And that's why these things happen. And so I thank God for my life, everything that I've been through, everything that I've been through. The last thing I did last night before I went to sleep, well, this morning before I went to sleep was cry. I cried because I miss my daughter. (laughs) So bereavement is another thing, but we can survive that. And I wasn't really crying like sad, sobbing, this and that. I was crying because of the realization that 
God is in control, that his will has been done. I was crying because I, I have this little plaque that a friend of ours gave us. She gave Rashida a pillow. She gave me a plaque with this thing on it, and, it, and, and it's entitled, As I Sit in Heaven. And so it's, it's worded like the person that you lost is telling you that they're sitting in heaven and they're watching you. They watch you when they cry, but they try to comfort you. They try to give you signs that they're okay and that you should be okay. And so I, I, I picked that plaque up and I read it, and I was like, Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you because, again, he provides. In every moment of our life, he provides what we need. He is a comforter. He gets us through it. And more than that, we don't just get through it. We're better because of it. It's hard to think that some of the things that we go through make us better, but I just believe that they do because they strengthen us if nothing else. Amen. All right, so we're going to just end with a prayer.